Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me, as usual, still, <laughs> is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Hello, Scott. Hel- no, I, I, that's that's not how it works. Well, but that is what you said. Okay. Maybe you should do that every episode. Nah, don't tell me what to do. That's what you say to your GPS. Take the next left, and he's yelling. Yeah, don't tell me I live my life. Jeepers. Well... Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. The content and discussion in this podcast often contain graphic and intense content. This may include descriptions of violence and death. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on any of the topics we present, nor are we professional journalists yet. (laughs) Oh, I don't know that yet. That yet will remain, I think. Yeah, that'll continue forever. I'm not going back to school. We're just two regular Canadians interested in crime and the darker side of history. So let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Jump, jump, jump. I did it again. This is episode 42. It totes is. According to Douglas Adams in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, is 42. So pretty much we've completed life. I guess so. That's terrifying. But the problem is that in that book, no one actually knows the question to which 42 is the answer. Hmm. Hmm. What is 21 plus 21? Maybe that's it. Maybe it is that simple. I solved it. Look at that. Scott, again, math wizard. (laughs) Physics professor and philosophy genius. (laughs) You know, I do it all. Before we get started, we want to let you folks know that there's a major announcement coming early next week regarding dark poutine. I'll be wearing pants during the recording from now on. No, that's not it. Oh. We can't get into details right now, but Scott and I are pretty excited about what this is going to mean for the future of this podcast. I'm pregnant. (laughs) I didn't do it. We're having a little baby podcast. It isn't mine. (laughs) This week will be our last Friday release, as we'll be moving release days to Sunday moving forward. So please don't panic when you don't hear us on a Friday next week. We'll be right there for you on Sunday. We, we've actually decided to just like randomly generate what day we're going to release them from now on. Well, people love a mystery. That's not true. Oh, all right. Not that kind of mystery. All right, fine. The best way not to miss us is to subscribe to us by using your favorite podcast catcher app. And you can even set it to auto download some of them. You can. You can. I don't. Some people do because on release day, we usually get a lot of downloads. Hi, that or people are actually looking for us on release day. Yeah, I think I think it's more of that because I know like with me, they were taking up a lot of space on my phone. Yeah, for sure. We want to thank our regular subscribers and welcome our new listeners. We appreciate that you're filling your ears with our dark poutine. It's sticky and burny as it is. Especially lately. We've had three intense episodes in a row after coming back from our hiatus. Jeez, yes. We covered the 1998 Swiss air crash in Peggy's Cove. Then we talked about the destruction of the entire Cook family in Stettler, Alberta in 1959. Mm. And we followed that up with the murders of five-year-old Nathan O'Brien and his grandparents, Kathy and Alvin Lickness in 2014. Yeah, all, all three of these were quite heavy. 
heavy, heavy, heavy topics and uh, left us both pretty drained. That was pretty tough slogging for everyone, listeners and hosts included. For sure. So Scott and I needed a bit of a palate cleanser, right? Totally. I'm sure you all do too. No chat about dead children this week. This week, We are not talking yes. about any any kids who have died this week. Yeah. Uh, for the time being. As one should. This week, we're tackling one of my favorite subjects as a boy. Mine as well. The magical life and mysterious death of illusionist, stunt performer, and debunker Harry Houdini. So, is this an away game? No. Hmm. Uh, wasn't Harry Houdini born in Hungary and immigrated to the United States uh, with his family as a boy, Mike? Yes, that is all true, Scott. It is Harry Houdini's death that is forever linked to Canada. Oh. Events that took place in Montreal in Houdini's dressing room at the Princess Theatre in the fall of 1926 may have led to Harry Houdini's demise. I don't know why that's always uh, slipped past me, the fact that Montreal played a role. I'm very well versed in in his death and everything. I guess it's not important to certain biographers where the event took place. Yeah. Just yeah. that it happened. Yeah, but for us, being based in Canada. Yes. Relevance. And there is a few relevant moments here in Canada with Harry Houdini, actually. So The time he went to my place for dinner? That didn't happen. It didn't. <laughs> Thank, thanks for spoiling. There you go. Growing up in a small town in Canada in the 1970s meant that you had to entertain yourself a lot. Mm, yeah. The internet wasn't very fast back then. It, there was no internet back then. Thus, how it was very slow. Other than a few pre-cable TV channels, the newspaper, movies, or the bookmobile. We didn't actually have a library at the time. We had a bookmobile that came to the museum every other for, weekend. For real? Yeah, it was a school bus that was done up like a library. Yeah, I and mean, we never had one. We had libraries here. Yeah, well, I'm from the sticks. Yeah, clearly. One of the ways that I did entertain myself was to order books from Scholastic Canada, and they're not a sponsor of the show. If I remember correctly, two or three times a year, our teachers would distribute a small catalog with an order form attached to hmm. each of the students. Hmm. I was always excited to see what interesting subjects and fascinating stories I could read about on my own. Look at you all learned. Well, I loved reading when I was a kid. Like I said, there was not a lot to do. Oh, I did not. It was a treat for me. I ordered books on fascinating topics like movie monsters, which had stories on Lon Chaney and how to do your own movie makeup. Oh, cool. I still have a copy of that book today. Oh, wow. Yeah. I blame Scholastic as one of the factors for my love of books. I still surround myself with them. One book I remember fondly that I had when I was around 9 or 10 was Robert Kraske's Harry Houdini, Master of Magic. You even remembered the author's name. That's pretty. Well, I there's this amazing thing called Google. Oh, I thought you were pulling that off the top of your head. Oh, no. Oh, well. I, I was trying to compliment you on, yeah. on your memory retention. My memory is bad yeah. because let's just say my teenage years are blurry. Yeah. And you're old. And I'm old. And so this book really fit into my love for things creepy. I loved what I read and fantasized about being some kind of showman myself one day. Mm, well, well. When I was reminded that Houdini's demise was connected to Canada, I felt we had to do this episode, so... Brilliant. Here goes. Harry Houdini was born Eric Wise to Rabbi Meyer Samuel Wise, a recent law school graduate, and Cecilia Steiner on March 24, 1874, in Budapest, Hungary. He was the fourth of seven children. When Eric was born, the rabbi and Cecilia lived in a tiny, one-room, kitchen and bedroom apartment. Meyer Samuel, Harry's dad, had dreams of going overseas to pursue his fortune. This led him to leave his growing family behind in 1876 when Eric was only two. The rabbi went ahead to America to get a jump start on life there for Cecilia and their children. Can you imagine, like, you're leaving Hungary in the 1870s to go to America? Because there weren't no planes. Boat. 
boat and horse cart. I wonder how long it would have taken to travel via boat. Typically like a, a week or two. Oh, really? Hmm. Yeah. Better than I thought. On my father's side, my grandmother and my grandfather met on a boat emigrating to Canada from Scotland. Oh, wow. Yeah, boats are huge in my life. I mean, in the origins of my life. Fair enough. Yeah, you know. In June of 1878, the family followed Mayor Samuel, paying $30 for a ticket on a crowded steamship. They came to New York by way of Hamburg, Germany. In 1878, 30 bucks was an astronomical number. That'd be like $37 currently. Yeah, I'm good at math. Upon arriving, due to Cecilia's inability to speak English, she had to converse with immigration officials in German. As a result, the family name was changed from Weiss to Weiss. Yeah. And the children's first names were changed a little as well. Little Eric with a K now now became Erich, spelled E H R I. C-H. Actually, I'll just use Eric instead of yeah. um, that, that, that tough one. Yeah. Er- Eric. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to have to pretend I'm German every time I say the name. I'd prefer it if you did. Cecilia and the kids went off to Appleton, Wisconsin, where, thanks to the generosity of a Jewish businessman, Rabbi Weiss set up the city's first temple. Oh, neat. Young Eric took to athletics right away. He loved running and racing his buddies on his bike, and so he was just a little kid. Mm -hmm. Another formative thing happened to him in Appleton. He saw his first circus. Although he'd loved all the other acts, wild animal tamers, clowns, acrobats, whatever, what really caught his eye was the tightrope walker. I think one of the things I was always most excited to see at a circus. Yeah, it's very intense. Yeah. The sense of danger and suspense and clear athletic skill and prowess of the performer mesmerized young Eric. Exactly. The young man, Gene Weitzman, had even hung by his teeth on the wire. I don't know if that's recommended. Eric knew he wanted to do this kind of thing right away. So, from William Kalish's book, The Secret Life of Houdini, here's our first quote. That afternoon, Eric rushed home, scrounged up some rope, and tied it between two trees an appropriate distance apart. The first time he tried to balance on the rope, he fell to the ground so violently that he could barely get up again. But he persevered and soon was adept at walking the tightrope. His replication of hanging by the teeth was not quite as successful. He hadn't realized that Weitzman had used a mouthpiece for the feet. Out came a couple of front teeth, Houdini remembered. But luckily, they grew back again. I guess they were his baby. Yes, I would imagine. He busted so. out his teeth on this on this rope. But you know, magician. Maybe he maybe he found a way to grow them back. Magic. Exactly. When Eric was eight years old, Rabbi Weiss lost his job. His congregation said he was too set in his ways, and they were much more progressive. They thought he was a fuddy duddy. Oh. The family, after a brief stint in Milwaukee, scraping to get by, had to be uprooted again. This time, they headed off to New York. Ooh. To help his family, young Eric sold newspapers and shine shoes for passerby on the street. Mm -hmm. On October 28, 1883, in a New York sandlot, billed as Eric the Prince of the Air, nine-year-old Eric Weiss gave his first professional performance as a trapeze artist, contortionist, and acrobat for Jack Heffler's Five Cent Circus. Mm -hmm. He'd been working a lot on contortion, although starting with simpler stunts like bending over backward to pick up a pin from the floor with his teeth. That's simple. He worked his way up to being able to twist his body in extreme ways, even becoming able to dislocate various joints to assist him in spectacular escapes he would perform later on. Yeah, yeah, nothing simple about any of that. No, like you can pop your shoulder out or your knee or whatever. That's soon to be 45. That just sounds like what happens to me after basic movements. Right? Like just, oh, things are dislocating and, uh You make those noises when you stand up now. It's not a joke. <laughs> At one point in his youth, Eric was sent back to Appleton to apprentice with a locksmith. He developed a fascination for picking locks of all shapes and sizes hanging out at this shop. He made a name for himself after unlocking all the doors to every shop on the street one night. Mm. (laughs) We're unsure if he ever used this talent for evil, as his father had admonished him against theft early in life. I don't think Houdini would have done anything for evil. Well... 
A local sheriff came by the locksmith shop with a prisoner he'd recently arrested. The handcuff key had snapped off in the lock, and now he couldn't get the prisoner's wrist free. <laughs> Eric fashioned a pick with some piano wire and freed the man quickly to the amazement of the sheriff and the locksmith. Hmm. Eric's real passion was performing, though, so he didn't follow through on his apprenticeship, but he did learn a ton about locks and how they worked and their vulnerabilities. Well, you know, honestly, it was probably his intent was to just learn about them. That knowledge would also come to serve him really well later on. Yes. Eric loved magic shows, too. His father took him often. Watching a magician conjure things out of thin air or make an entire person vanish fascinated the young boy. Harry had another, new obsession. He began to teach himself as much about the magical arts as he could. During this time, however, Harry's oldest brother Herman passed away from tuberculosis. As Rabbi Weiss was devastated, the magic shows were out for a while. Eric, being the mensch that he was, provided the $10 for the funeral from the funds he'd made doing odd jobs and shows. Mm. A mensch, for those of you who need a translation, is Yiddish for a person of integrity and honor. I always thought it was an insult. No, a mensch is not an ins- oh, insult. Okay. Hmm. No. Nebish. If you call somebody a nebbish, that's like calling them a nothing. I guess I've been complimenting all these people who keep cutting me off in traffic. you're such a mensch. Well, it can be used sarcastically. You damn mensch. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well. Yiddish lessons for Scott. Explains all the looks. (laughs) As Eric grew into a teenager, he took up running, gymnastics, and amateur boxing. By then, he was doing coin and card tricks at the nearby community centers and billing himself as Eric the Great... When he was 17, however, Eric became entranced by a book called The Memoirs of Robert Houdin, Ambassador, Author, and Conjurer, written by himself. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) In the book, Eric found a fantastic tale of another man obsessed with magic. Harry would later say that Robert Houdin became his hero and guide teaching him the ways of magic, and, from The Secret Life of Houdini, quote, a magician is an actor playing the part of a man who has supernatural powers. Mm-hmm. Eric also believed that a magician must appear as though he himself believes. Presentation and showmanship were the keys to a magician's success. A change of name was in order to honor his hero. From this point on, he would be billed as Harry Houdini. At 17, Harry struck out on his own to pursue what was to become one of the most memorable careers in magic in the 20th century. Yeah, the fact that we still talk about him and... and, uh, He's been dead since 1926, almost 100 years. Yeah, and he's still such a a popular name. Little did young Harry Houdini know that famous magicians like David Copperfield, Doug Henning, Penn and Teller, David Blaine, Chris Angel, and many more would point to him as the inspiration for their successful careers in the magical arts. Yeah, well, I think looking back now, we can understand why. But yeah, he, he never would have guessed. James Randi, another mm-hmm. another famous debunker. The man they call Ravine. I don't think Harry would like Ravine that much. No, nah, he was a hypnotist. Yeah. But man. <laughs> he was the man they call Ravine. The man they call Ravine. I actually saw Ravine. Did you? I did. Live? I did. Wow, how was that? It was interesting. I went with my folks when I was young. I was probably about 11 or 12. Oh, I would have loved it. Yeah, it was fantastic. People, you know, swimming around pretending to escape the Titanic and things like that. That would have been a blast at that age. It was fun. Young Harry took a gig doing as many as 20 magic shows daily at a dime museum. Wow. On October 5th, 1892, Rabbi Samuel Meyer West died of complications from a tongue cancer operation. Harry had to leave one of his shows to go and be by his father. Mm, I I would imagine so, yeah. Harry promised his father on his deathbed to always take care of Cecilia and the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. Harry did not want to let his dad down. He had a brief stint with a partner doing shows around New York, a friend called Jacob Hyman, as the brothers Houdini. Mm. Harry was particular about how he wanted things to go. I don't know anybody like that. And after that, after that <laughs> partnership dissolved, he partnered with his brother, Theo. They wowed crowds on the street for change at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Harry strode about in brown makeup and robes, playing his version of an Indian yogi. I don't think that'd go over very well no. nowadays. Theo was his assistant, using sleight of hand and a chant, 
this, quote, yogi, seemed to make seeds appear to sprout instantly. Mm -mm. But I guess they made some cash. Uh, People really dug their little show that they did there on the street. Oh, very awesome. After the exposition, Harry went solo, doing more shows at dime museums. In his off time, he started working with Theo on other larger stunts, the ones he'd become the most known for, escapes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And here's where we'll take a break. They called their first escape stunt Houdini's Box. Oh. From the secret life of Houdini, quote, The Houdini's Box was actually a steamer trunk that could be thoroughly and completely examined by audience members. Harry would then be bound and placed into a cloth sack that was tied shut. He was then locked into the trunk, which was roped and then enclosed from view by what was called a cabinet. It was actually a frame with fabric draped around it on three sides and a curtain in the front. Sounds like some chambers we've talked about in other episodes. Yeah. Ew, not comfortable. Theo would then stand inside the cabinet and announce, Behold a miracle. He would close the curtain and clap his hands three times. The curtain immediately was pulled open to reveal Harry, liberated, standing in front of the box. <laughs> One supposed naysayer, a grizzled but popular older showman named Risey, claimed he'd show Houdini as a fraud and offered himself to be locked into the box and escape as Harry had. <laughs> Houdini said he would pay Risey $100 if he were successful in his exposition. Uh. People came from everywhere to watch. Harry did his thing first, and then Risey was brought up, bragging loudly that he knew a fraud when he saw one. <laughs> Risey was placed into the sack and locked into the trunk. Five minutes ticked by as the audience waited for Risey to appear. Risey began to pound and scream for help inside the box. Harry and Theo ran up to the curtain, opened the box, and made a huge show of cutting the bag open to free the panting older man. (laughs) It has been speculated that Risey was in on the gag from the outset to generate more interest and, in parentheses, money for that night's stunt. Yeah, and I guess uh, also more legitimize uh, the difficulty in what they do. Sure. Yeah. Among those cheering for Harry in the wings was an 18-year-old singer and dancer whose real name was Wilhelmina Beatrice Rahner, but she went by Bess Raymond, thankfully, so I don't have to say that (laughs) name a bunch of times. And she was in a stage group called the Floral Sisters. Oh, I'm assuming flowers were involved? I guess so. After a brief courtship, Bess and Harry, very much in love, were married on June 22, 1894. Aww. Quickly, the perky, pretty Bess was the logical replacement for Theo in Houdini's act, now billed as the great Houdini's. So get out of here, hairy brother. Poor Theo. Oh, well. I don't think Theo went on to become a magician himself, so he did fine on his own. Living with the trauma of having been kicked to the curb. I'm Theo Houdini. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Oh, well. Oh, Oh, Houdini's performing this weekend. Let's go see... Oh, Theo. Uh, Yeah. Harry's personality was much larger than his physical stature at only 5'5". Even I'm taller than that. I'm not. (laughs) Stop. They traveled with the Welsh Brothers Circus for a time, and Harry even tried his hand at being a partner in and managing a burlesque show until it folded in 1896. That would have been neat to see, a Houdini burlesque show. Well... He wasn't in it. What? That's not, not... Yes, that's not... At a public display at the New Britain police station, Harry escaped from every pair of police-issue handcuffs belonging to the department that were presented. Hmm. Harry wanted to take things up a notch for his traveling show. He began calling local police up on stage at his shows to present their finest cuffs. In St. John, New Brunswick... Woo, woo. On June 10th, 1896, the police there provided leg irons and handcuffs, claiming no man could escape from these. And Houdini didn't. End of story. The end. It was a great story. No, that's not how it goes. Harry was chained up tightly and put into his curtained cabinet. He called eerily the ghost box. (laughs) Mere moments later, Houdini emerged, having escaped the handcuffs and leg irons, smugly handing them back to the officers whose mouths hung agape. Hmm. The crowds went nuts. Some believed Houdini was in partnership with the devil or other dark forces. Clearly. 
Clearly. It it's no other explanation. There is no other explanation to Well, maybe that he, or he's a ghost. Could be. Well, he is now. <laughs> uh, sad ending to that little... Uh... Sorry. <laughs> Jeez. Harry was well on his way now to the big time. People began to call him the Handcuff King. <laughs> escape, though. Harry taught himself to escape from a straitjacket by dislocating his shoulder. <sighs> his brother was watching him and thought the crowd would love to watch him writhing and flailing about trying to escape, and he was right. This stunt, a staple of Houdini's later full shows, was a hit right away. Oh, yeah. Most images that run through my head uh, have to do with him in straight jackets. Yeah. In 1897, Harry and Bess added clairvoyance to their shows as a spookier element. Ooh. They claimed Bess could commune with the spirits of the dead. Mm-hmm. Bess was seated and covered in a shroud while Harry led the audience in religious hymns to set the mood. Harry would wave his hand and poof, Bess was in a trance. Harry would then question her, sometimes about a recent unsolved local murder. When Bess seemed to answer as the victim, there were members of the audience who fainted or fled the show in fright. Yeah, they got the vapors. Yeah. It was interesting that Houdini used clairvoyance in those early shows, Although Harry had been interested in seances and spiritualism since he was a teen, he debunked as many as he could as frauds. Yeah. I guess he was thinking a buck was a buck at the time and it was entertainment. Well, we all grow and evolve. Yeah. You know, there's things I believed in as a child that now I'm quite skeptical of and stuff. So Yeah. Or as a younger adult and now I'm more skeptical. Absolutely. So. Deep down he knew there was more to it, uh, as he would later admit. He realized that people were looking for a genuine connection to the afterlife for answers. Mm -hmm. What happened to Uncle Jack? Was Mother happy where she was? Did the afterlife actually exist? It finally got to Harry and he stopped doing spiritualism as a part of their act. He wrote later, I was brought to a realization of the seriousness of trifling with the hallowed reverence which the average human being bestows on the departed. I was chagrined that I should ever have been guilty of such frivolity and for the first time realized that it bordered on crime. Jeez, it, it was Houdini just here? He was here. Whoa! Harry continued doing handcuff and leg iron escape shows at police departments all around the U.S. and Canada, offering the astronomical sum of $100 to anyone who had a pair of handcuffs he couldn't escape. Mm-hmm. Luckily, Harry was able to live up to his reputation and never had to pay the reward because he didn't have it in those days. <laughs> Well, phew. Yeah, exactly. After one show, packed to the rafters with spectators, police, and reporters, Harry finally had made it. Harry's picture in shackles, of course, was in the Chicago Journal, right on the front page with the title, Amazes Detectives. (laughs) From the Secret Life of Houdini, one detective stated, and I'll read this in the detective voice. Oh, detective voice. I cannot explain how that fellow got out of those handcuffs, Lieutenant Rohan marveled. It was simply impossible to either pick the lock or slip them off. I would have banked my life that a prisoner bound as he would would never regained his freedom. It was miraculous. These cuffs are the best made, and that prisoner they will not hold cannot be kept in custody by the strongest bars or the best locks. It was beautiful. These displays were popular, but not yet the huge spectacle that Harry desired. He created a full show of his own multiple stunts, culminating in one usually death-defying stunt. In 1900, a year and a half after the Chicago Journal article, Harry was famous in the U.S. and Canada. The show was making 400 bucks a week. Jeez, I'd take that now. (laughs) Harry and Bess traveled to Europe with their show, with Bess now having less stage time. They traveled all across the continents, wowing crowds for the next five years. I see what you did there with Bess and Les. Well, yeah. well done. Yeah. There's lots of speculation that Harry Houdini was acting as a spy for the U.S. government while he was traveling about Europe. Well, that would have been exciting, but I don't think so. Uh, there's some. There's really? there's a few books written about it. Really? Yeah, they go into it in detail in the Secret Life of Harry Houdini. It goes into that? Mm-hmm. Is there a uh, TV show about it instead of no. a book? No. Oh, shit. We're unsure if these things are accurate or if they're just part of the Houdini mystique. After his return to the U.S., 
In 1906, Harry Houdini published a book called The Right Way to Do Wrong, an expose of successful criminals. Oh. He interviewed criminals and police alike to determine the best ways to get away with many crimes. Interesting, eh? Uh, yeah. I have the book. I just haven't read it yet. <laughs> Harry's popularity blew up even more in the intervening years. He continued to escape from handcuffs, escape from prisons and jails. He was even given certificates from prison officials on his escape saying, we thought nobody could escape. This guy did. <laughs> He'd done simple handcuffs to death, and he wanted to up the ante. Harry jump, jumped off bridges, hogtied and manacled, only to pop up moments later, handcuffs and leg irons in hand. Like I, it, it, when you hear stuff like that, you can like it makes complete sense as to why he is still relevant. Like it seems like such a technically basic. Like you don't have like uh, the current, uh, you know, with. Uh, you mentioned him. You had his own A and E and show, there. Chris Angel. Yeah, where you know you got all these lights and everything. Like that's just basic technology, but terrifying. Like if you think about you being pushed off in that, that's like death. Yes, it's it's a man and his wits. Yeah, essentially, or his abilities. And that's the beauty of it, though. Just the basics. He was suspended from cranes over streets and bridges upside down in his straight jacket. What you're talking about, I'm sure, is some of that video. Well, and we've all done that, right? <laughs> no. Well, we've all done that. No, we have not. Mm. Onlookers were amazed at the magician wriggling out of the jacket only later to wave like it was nothing. Yeah. 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 Houdini was manacled, put into a wooden packing crate, and lowered into the water over the side of a boat. Yeah. No, I wouldn't do it. He later appeared at the surface of the water only 57 seconds later, and the crowd was stunned. Of course. The crate was brought up, inspected, and found to be completely intact. Harry's handcuffs and leg irons were still inside. Like, I don't what know. The hell? How did he do that? Pretty cool. He's totes a ghost. It's like Casper. <laughs> he added the milk can escape to his act in 1908, which was a staple for the next four years. And I'll post a picture in our show notes of uh, Harry in the milk can, but it looks ridiculous. Are those were like, uh, I think I know what those look like. They it's weren't like, very large. It's like, well, it was a big, it was an industrial sized one. So pretty big. It was big enough for a man to, yeah, okay. to wiggle himself into. Sure. You'll see. Let's, let's do a, let's post a video of us doing that. No, uh -huh. <laughs> I wouldn't fit in it. <laughs> Even though I'm the same size as Harry Houdini, I'm probably <laughs> twice what he weighed. I might be able to fit in it. I still ain't going to do it. Harry was shackled, placed into this industrial-sized milk can that had been filled with water. Before being sealed in, Harry would ask the audience to watch his last breath as he went in. They were to try and hold their breath as long as the escape took. Just brilliant. Harry would be sealed in, and the can would then be placed behind a curtain. The audience literally holding their breath. Just brilliant. Of course, failure would mean death for Harry, and having an entire crowd going without air, most for less than a minute, added to the suspense as the time ticked by. Like seriously, what what a genius way to get the audience like literally involved in what's happening and guaranteed will exhale and he's still going to be in there. Right. And, and it's just like brilliant. The weight was excruciating. Yeah. It had to be. Yeah. Like, like a suspense movie where you're just on the edgy, like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Some people screamed that Houdini must be dead and for the can to be opened as the curtain remained closed. I picture Houdini free after only a few seconds behind yeah. the curtain, dripping wet, giggling to himself with glee, just waiting for the right moment to pop out breathlessly to his cheering fans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, could you, I would love to be in his shoes and be able to do that and just absorb the glee, that internal glee. Yeah, as people were screaming and fainting. Knowing and like, oh, wow, and... like I've really, I, I've really tricked them. Like, yeah. It's just a, what a great feeling that would be. It would be awesome. Houdini was becoming rich and famous. He was even able to afford his own airplane that he also learned to fly on his own. Damn, that's like that's like P. Diddy money. P. Diddy. Oh, yeah. Or Drake money. I don't know. Whatever is relevant to money. I don't know. Yeah. Drake, I, Drake would be relevant. Drake would be relevant? Okay, he's got that Drake money. So Houdini was flying his own plane. <laughs> he was flying it? Yeah. Why not? What the hell can he, learned, he do? He learned to fly. What can't he do? After the milk can, he had a specially built glass case filled with water. It was advertised as the Chinese water torture cell. 
And please don't message us saying I'm being racist because that was what it was called and billed as at the it time. It was the 1900s. Mike didn't create this name. Correct. He was lowered into the cell, head first, suspended by his ankles. A curtain was placed in front of the case, and Harry would do his thing, appearing after an appropriate amount of pants crapping by the audience. <laughs> Interestingly, Harry never called it the water torture cell. He referred to it as the Upside Down. Oh, interesting name. Perhaps the writers of Stranger Things are Houdini fans? You know, yeah, I wonder. It could be. I wonder. The ups, Harry's in the Upside Down. If you guys are listening, creators of Stranger Things, first- As I'm sure they are. First, thanks for listening. This is really totes awesome. Uh, second, yeah, send us a message. Let us know. Sure. Or tweet, or, or to our listeners, tweet the hell out of them. Yes, in 1915, Harry first performed his Buried Alive stunt, and it saw him placed in a hole six feet deep and then covered with dirt. Sounds simple? It does. Harry almost died, clawing his way out of the grave, and dropped unconscious upon being pulled out. Yes, and a magician, I believe in the early 2000s, tried to replicate that with concrete and a plexiglass. And uh, almost died. No, did die. Oh, did die? Yeah, did die. Like, there's video of it and stuff. I think it was, I think, aired live or something like oh, that. God. There's a moment where you just see the collapse and the, the concrete <laughs> go down and yeah, hectic digging, and it's terrible. Yeah, Harry wrote about it later, saying the earth was crushing. Yeah. He adjusted the stunt to have a lot less danger using a sealed casket in a swimming pool. Yeah. He was placed in there with his straight jacket on, et cetera. Yeah. I, I guess safer? <laughs> in 1918... Harry took his star power to the silver screen in a film called The Master of Mystery. He even owned his own movie studio. What the hell can't he do? Harry played Quentin Locke, a Justice Department agent who was sent to bust up an evil crime syndicate that employed a robot called Q the Automaton. Oh my god, that sounds great. Q came off more silly than sinister. Q the Automaton. Yes. Love it. Harry did a lot of his own stunts in the films, obviously. In his second movie, The Grim Game, Harry can be seen dangling from a rope and transitioning from one biplane to another. Yeah, we, I've seen that foot. I've seen that. Not, not the movie, but the footage. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. There's no CGI then no. Or, or safety ropes or anything. He legitimately did that. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's not recommended that anybody else try that. No. Sadly, Harry's movies were nowhere as good as his live shows, and his last film was released in 1923 to mixed reviews. Jeez, you think in 1923, like, anything would be great. They can't be like, oh, not this old thing again. How many times do we have to see this? Like, everything's fair new. Enough, fair enough. So to get mixed reviews, I mean, huh? Yeah. I've seen better. It's a typey type. Horrible. <laughs> The Roaring Twenties also saw Houdini make a lot of enemies as the great debunker of fraudulent mediums and spiritualists. His career as a debunker began in earnest in 1908 upon the publishing of his book bashing his namesake's work called The Unmasking of Robert Houdin. Hmm. He essentially called his namesake a fake. Yeah. In 1913, after Harry's mother Cecilia died at 74, it's said that Harry and Bess tried diligently to contact Cecilia's spirit in the afterlife. They participated in seance with mediums who, although claiming to have a connection with the beyond, Harry easily debunked each as charlatans wanting to fleece the famous illusionist for his cash. I fully agree with him on that. It's exactly how I feel. I love the concept of seances, and I love watching stuff mm -hmm. about it. It's, it's fun to be scared and, and whatnot with that kind of stuff, but he's completely right. It, in my opinion, it is just charlatans wanting to fleece uh, money. I don't feel like I've ever seen a real one. No. No, I'd love to. I'd love for to get for there to be a real one, and I see it because I'd, I'd poo my pants. Poo my pants. Poo my pants. Harry gave talks all across the country showing slides of these hucksters and their methods, explaining how to trip them up in their lies. Yeah, brilliant. All the while, Harry craved that real connection with the afterlife. Over the spring and summer of 1924, Harry went to Boston where he set about to debunk the abilities of a Canadian medium claiming telekinetic powers, named Mina Marjorie Crandon. Hmm. Marjorie had even taken in Sherlock Holmes writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with her table moving and mystical bell ringing. Well. 
Marjorie had applied to win a prize for proven telekinetic powers from Scientific American. After attending five seances, Harry and the folks at Scientific American had figured out all of Marjorie's tricks, and she was denied the lucrative prize. Good. Harry even went so far as adding her methods to his performances, showing people exactly what she'd done and how she did it. Good for him. Also in 1924, and this is kind of cool, Harry Houdini teamed up with one of my favorite authors, H.P. Lovecraft. Mm. Lovecraft ghost wrote a story for Harry called Imprisoned with the Pharaohs, and I totally dig ancient Egypt stuff. Yeah, like same. Love, love, love. Same. This was published in Weird Tales magazine. In it, Harry tells the story of an entirely fictional first-hand account of being kidnapped and having to use his prowess at escape to free himself, only to later stumble into a terrifying underworld of strange beasts and tentacled creatures. It happens. I might read that as to a, me as a bonus episode one day hey, there you on go. our Patreon. That could be fun. Sweet. Occult groups unhappy with Harry's spouting about the unproven afterlife supposedly cursed Harry and his wife in the fall of 1926. Mm. First, Bess became extremely ill with tomaine poisoning. What on earth is that? Uh, I should have looked that up, but I did not. Uh, it sounds like something like I think her, it's food poisoning. It sounds like something happened to her toe. Tomaine. Like, oh, I stubbed my toe. I've got tomaine poisoning. <laughs> I didn't look it up. <laughs> Some folks will tell us what tomaine poisoning is, I'm sure. Let's go with what I said. Sure. Soon after, Harry broke his ankle doing the water torture cell. Mm. These events closely preceded what is debated to have led to Harry's untimely demise. In his dressing room at the Princess Theater on Friday, October 22nd, 1926, Concordia University students Sam Smiley and Jacques Price waited to meet Harry Houdini. Smiley wanted to draw a portrait of Harry, and he had agreed. Upon entering Harry's dressing room, they found him propped up on a pillow on his couch, suffering from his broken ankle. Hmm. After a few minutes of drawing, a knock came to the door, and a man entered. His name was J. Gordon Whitehead. He sounds like he should be a mortgage loan... He wanted to return a book he'd borrowed from Houdini days earlier. Immediately, the tone in the room changed, though, as Whitehead asked Houdini odd questions like whether he believed in the miracles of the Bible and whether Houdini could really withstand hard blows to his stomach from any man. Houdini said he'd proven that quite a few times, and he didn't really want to talk about the Bible. And when Whitehead asked Harry whether he could strike him, Harry agreed. But before Houdini could prepare, the sizable whitehead at six foot two began raining blows to the diminutive Harry's right side below the belt. Hmm. Well, belts, the pants were worn pretty high at that time. Harry waved for the man to stop. The three men all left Harry's room soon after that. The crazy attack signaled the end of the party. I would say, yeah. That night, Harry had painful cramps near the site of the blows he'd received by whitehead. Bess, still under the weather herself, massaged him. Although unwell, he performed again in Toronto a day later and then quickly in Detroit after that. He had a fever of 104 degrees. And a broken ankle. And a broken ankle. Harry was admitted to Detroit's Grace Hospital and surgery was performed on Monday, October 25, 1926, according to The Secret Life of Houdini. Right after the exploratory incision, quote, Pus overflowed from Houdini's abdomen and spilled onto the floor of the operating room. Houdini's appendix was a great long affair which started in the right lower pelvis where it normally should, extended across the midline and lay in his left pelvis at exactly where the blows had been struck. Hmm. He concluded that Houdini's appendix had ruptured, allowing deadly poison to seep into his system. He removed the gangrenous mass that had been Houdini's appendix and closed him up. Hmm. End quote. Sounds quite disgusting. Very and bad. painful. Although Harry had appeared to be improving over the next few days, perhaps fittingly, he passed away on Sunday, October 31st, 1926. Halloween. The day we started this podcast. In uninteresting. With Bess at his side. Yeah. Some hoped that Harry would escape from this too, but it wasn't to be. He was really gone. Mm. 
The official cause of death was peritonitis and gangrene, but many point to the moments in Harry's dressing room as the beginning of his death. Was he murdered? Who was J. Gordon Whitehead? He was a student at Concordia and said to have been an amateur boxer. Was he just a brash youngster who jumped the gun, or was he an assassin hired by a resentful spiritualist due in the great debunker? Uh, I'm going to go with no. If you're going to try to uh, plan an assassination, hiring somebody to punch somebody is typically not the method to do so. You're going well, to poison them. Well, the or... dim mock, the death punch that exists in Kung Fu. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We'll never know for sure what happened because all the players are dead. It's just a tragedy, though. Harry and Bess had had a lot of conversations about the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Harry had promised he would try to contact Bess if he could. So she was to have a seance every anniversary of his death. Yeah, yeah. For 10 years. Oh, a, a poor, a poor old heartbroken woman. Yeah. Mm. Bess took Houdini at his word. Every Halloween for that 10 years, she held a seance with noted mediums of the day, hoping to contact Houdini. She even offered $10,000 to any proof of contact with her beloved from beyond. Hmm. Although she thought one might have been the real deal, she was still left disappointed. Yeah, yeah. The last seance on October 31st, 1936 was recorded. Bess's business manager, Edward Saint, overseeing the seance, asked Bess's verdict conclusion at the conclusion of the event. Here's some audio. Hmm. Mrs. Houdini... The zero hour has passed. The ten years are up. Have you reached a decision? Yes. Houdini did not come through. My last hope is gone. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. After faithfully following through the ten-year Houdini compact, using every type, medium, and seance, it is now my personal and positive belief that spirit communication in any form is impossible. I do not believe that ghosts or spirits exist. The Houdini Shrine has burned for 10 years. I now reverently turn out the light. It is finished. Good night, Harry. Wow. Yeah. So uh, her enunciation was fantastic. Yes. It was reported that immediately after her declaration, there was a brief thunder shower that washed over the roof of the Dickerbocker Hotel there in Hollywood. It soaked the attendees at the event to the bone, hmm. stopping as suddenly as it began. As everyone in California knows, thunder showers are very rare, and when it does rain, it rains for days on end. Hmm. Harry, perhaps? I'd like to think so. Interesting, right? Yeah. Harry Houdini remains a popular historical and somewhat mythological figure. There are many articles and websites dedicated to the master that have differing descriptions of the facts around Harry's life and death. He's still one of my favorites. It, it, but isn't that kind of exactly true to the man himself? Like, my, my, there's still mystery. Uh, somebody even stole and destroyed the bust of Harry that was in the cemetery uh, multiple times, apparently. Really? Yeah. Much of the research came from sources online that we'll post in the show notes, as well that uh, book that I mentioned continually, The Secret Life of Harry Houdini, The Making of America's First Superhero by William Kalush. That was a pretty great source. Hmm. So what do you think, Scott? Was that a an interesting take on the Harry Houdini story? Yeah, I, I loved it. And uh, certainly uh, less heavy than children being murdered. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I needed that. So a little bit of history instead of murder this week. It, it's still, I, you know. It's still dark and it's still <sighs> sort of. For, I, I think that there is still a supernatural flavor to it in some oh, regard. Sure. And so that kind of fits with what we do still. And mm -hmm. um, uh, it just it gets, uh, it really does allow us to cleanse our palate. And we'll do, we'll do more of that stuff too. For sure. We have to. Let's talk about this week's patron patrons, Patreon patrons. Let's do it. This week's good eggs, and this is quite a list. Good. Uh, this week's good eggs are... Two that we missed, apparently, are first, Lisa Emilianowicz from Milton, Ontario. I hope that was close, Lisa. It sounded good to me. And welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much for your contribution. 
Second is Sarah Sheikh from Woolwich, London in the UK. Carol, who li- used to live in Saudi Arabia, taught me how to pronounce that last name. I used to say Sheikh, but now I would say Sheikh. And hopefully that's the way Sarah pronounces it as well. Oh, well, we're super stoked to have you, Sarah. Tamara Rempel from Edmonton, Alberta. Whoop, My whoop. spidey sense tells me this is another relative of Tyler and the McCanns from episode 37. Whether you are or not, regardless, thank you so much for supporting the show, Tamara. Absolutely, Tamara. Thank you. Stacy Ouellette sent us some donut money via PayPal. Thank you very much, Stacy. Thanks, Stacy. Quinn Marie Suchor from Evergreen Park, Illinois. And I just think, did I pronounce Suchor correctly or Succor or I don't know. I'm saying names I've never seen before. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. Welcome, Quinn Marie. Thank you very much for helping us out. Helen Foster from Wesley, New South Wales in Australia. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hel- Helen. Nicole F. Greenwood from Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you for having an easy name to pronounce. Oh, you, we, and I, thank you. I'm sure we still screwed it up somehow. For, okay. But, for supporting the show. Yeah, we are grateful to have you, Nicole. Jill Citron from Los Gatos, California. And I believe gatos would be cats in Spanish. And I like my two little boozy gatos. So that would be the cats. Yes. Oh, cool. Welcome, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Kayla Reno, another Kayla or Kyla or... There's many of them in our Patreon and in our Yumber Yard, so... We've got more than enough room for all of them. Well, yeah, we are welcome. Memphis, Tennessee is where my good buddy Bennett grew up. And well, Kayla... Carly Morrison from Springfield, Missouri. Thank you, Carly. Thanks, Carly. I don't, I, I've never been to Missouri, I don't think. I've never been to a lot of places. That's Missouri cool. would be one of them. Stephanie Ray Miniak from Victoria, B.C. See, I said it the Polish way. Tee hee. Hey, welcome, Stephanie. And uh, you're just a little jump over the water there. She was making fun of me in the Yumber Yard saying I probably wouldn't pronounce it correctly. I probably didn't. <laughs> Marty Scoville from Edmonton, Alberta. Thanks, Marty. I'm beginning to think that Edmonton has forgiven us. Well, let's hope so. Welcome, Marty. Katie Beth from St. Margaret's Bay, Nova Scotia. Thanks, Katie. St. Margaret's Bay is relative to the Swiss Air 111 crash we talked about. It's such a beautiful spot in Nova Scotia, though, one of my faves. I can imagine. And, uh, And welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for helping us. David Paulson, a.k.a. El Dudito. (laughs) Love from, it. From Dunloring, Virginia. Yeah, interesting. Well, welcome, El, El Dudito. El Dudito. Hey, welcome, El Dudito. If you want to have What nicknames. accent was that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, you've just made up an accent. I love El, it. El Dudito. Sure. Okay. I like it. El Dudito. Lindsay Quinn from Georgetown, Ontario. Thank you, Lindsay. Big time thank you. More Canadians. All right. And another person from the UK. This is Gary Dugdale, and he's from Gateshead, Tyne, and Ware. Wow, okay. In Great Britain. That's awesome. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. It still just blows my mind when when it's realized that we have people in other parts of the the globe. (laughs) Yeah. Listening to us, like uh, that there's somebody in Tyne and Ware listening to our squirrely little voices. Is that amazing or it, what? It's pretty, it's a pretty amazing feeling. It's cool. Yeah. Thanks so much to our patrons past and present for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine or for a one-time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email, dark podcast, gmail.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who supports us. All those thank yous. Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search Dark Poutine and tell your friends, especially fun, as I, we mentioned every week, is the Yumber Yard, and more and more people are joining. We're well over 900 now. Oh, we're getting close to a, a G. Holy smokes. Oh, that's awesome. I'm blown away. And the amount of emails I'm getting lately has gone up too mm-hmm. at our dark poutine podcast at gmail.com. People realize, hey, wait, not only can I PayPal them there, I could probably contact them there as well. Yeah, so I get yeah. tons and tons of email. That's awesome. And yeah, I, I, I love the Umber Yard, especially over the last few days. There's been a lot of uh, 
uh, kind words said yes. for, for Mike and I. And, and sorry, I, I haven't replied. Uh, I plan to do so over the next few days, but it, I've just been, uh, I, I've had to take up a, a part-time job, which is extremely strenuous. And I, uh, I'm for fo- his little tiny body. I, I'm almost 45 and I have, uh, osteoporosis. And so, uh, you know, a lot of heavy lifting uh, exhausts me. And then emotionally, I've been drained for a couple of days. And so uh, I will engage soon. So I don't want people to think I'm ignoring. It's just, uh, yeah, I've just been trying to go home and uh, uh, rest. Brittle bones. <laughs> Wait, was that uh, an episode of The Simpsons? He's got bonitis. Bonitis. That's what I've got. I've got bonitis. You can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory like iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or Spotify. That's it for this week. I feel a lot lighter than I did the last three episodes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting how many times after we record, I go home and have dreams in relation to the same uh, stories that we cover. Well, you can go home and have Harry Houdini dreams. <laughs> It'll be fine. I'll, uh, for some reason, I'm going to wake up feeling very claustrophobic. There you go. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. See ya. See ya.